practice. Also, he is also the award-winning Dr. Mark Richards and is respected by the Royal Society Awards of Imperial Physicists for his dedication to equity in science. And can you believe he got into science and physics by sound systems? <laughs> oh, I'll let him explain that, man. And he's a staunch supporter of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey. But that's the level of this international brother. Brothers and sisters, please, please join me in welcoming onto the Hidden Truth platform, Dr. Mark Richards, the physicist that's of international acclaim. And we're honored to have him on the Hidden Truth program. Come on, oh, 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 Jurita, oh, 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 oh my God, Ron Spears from Detroit is even clapping now, come on, no, <laughs> oh my God. no, come on, you're too kind, you're too kind. Brother Andrew, Brother Andrew, Hidden Truth family, you're well, way too kind. I mean, uh, the, that person you introduced, I don't even recognize myself in there. Uh, <laughs> I, I'm, simply, I'm simply me, and, and I, I believe whatever I can do, anyone else in our community can do uh, if they put their mind to it. So, uh, but no, thank you for the warm, warm welcome. And I'm, again, as always, I'm always, it's always a pleasure to be here and to, to share some of, some of what I know with, with, with the Hidden Truth family. Brother, um, Dr. Mark, I, I, again, I want to say to you publicly, brother, that um, as a black man to another black man, I love you, King. I love your spirit. I love your humility. I bow to your knowledge and your wisdom, brother. And the fact that you are a conscious brother, that, um, that you know, you could have just said, you know what, I've got, you know, I'm a physicist, I'm a scientist, I, I'm well respected in the, in the world of professional um, affairs. But no, 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 brother, you're found in the black community and you're found helping um, to produce young black scientists and, and not just black scientists, young scientists from disadvantaged areas. Brother, we salute you and we thank almighty God, Allah, for you and your example to us, brother. Well, again, thank, thank, thank you for, for, again, all those kind words, but uh, hopefully I'm just doing what... what, what any any sort of um, uh, person with, in, in, a, in a position to do so would, would want to do because uh, uh, that's what we need to do in our community. And I'm a firm believer that um, I'm really doing it because I believe the community need, we need more scientists and engineers so that we can really uh, both empower ourselves, both in knowledge, but economically empower ourselves because often these are drivers for uh, lots of uh, different areas. So that's why I, I just don't want our young people to miss out on the opportunity so I want them to make an informed choice. So that's why I'm, I'm quite a strong advocate in that area. And I think as well, um, as much as um, we want the, the, you know, the young people maybe to take up science and so on, uh, it's important to educate the community as a whole um, of the importance of science because it affects all of our lives in different ways. Um, so yeah, I mean, that, that's basically what drives me. And I'm, again, it's a pleasure to be here and it's probably been too long, but I'm glad to be back. All right, brother, I'm going to shut my mouth, King, and um, I'm going to hand over to you, my soldier. No one's come to see me. Everyone has come to see you, brother. So they want to hear from my King, my brother, and my fellow soldiers. It's all yours, Dr. Mark. Okay. Uh, can you see that at all? Yes, we can see it clearly, King. Once you start your... Um, yeah, that's it. It's all yours, big brother. Okay. Well, again, uh, it's a pleasure to be here. Um, and well, Brother Andrew has sort of molded this title, The Science of Revolution, uh, which is an interesting, interesting title. And in a way, revolution, you know, I suppose there is a, a, a kind of science to it. So um, when I'm in these situations, uh, the first thing I do to set the context, as I normally do, is remind us what Marcus Garvey said. Um, that, and it was an instruction to parents near enough 100 years ago now that you must teach the higher developments of science to your children for in science and religion lies our only hope to withstand the evil designs of modern materialism and that's part of what drives me because he was warning us he was as to say forewarning us that if we can't stop if you like technological progress but if we are not involved in that process then we will just become consumed by it and consumers of it and have very little influence on it 
Um, so again, and he also reminded us in the second paragraph that, that, that we occupied a high position in the world, not just artistically, but also scientifically, commercially. Um, and at some point we lost our place um, and others occupy, uh, others now occupy uh, that place that we, 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 once, we once held. So again, um, this is, this is a, a message, if you like, from our ancestors to say, you know, now more than any other time that we, we really do need to start um, trying to um, at least become more scientifically literate, because otherwise, how will you know whatever is being prescribed to you uh, is actually good for you or with your best interest in mind? So today, I'm just going to touch on a few things, um, in a sense, uh, more of a, uh, an insight into maybe uh, the components of a, of a revolution. Um, and then we're going to talk about change and, and, and societal change and how you can change uh, invoke change and be a catalyst for change. Um, perhaps, and then we're going to touch a little bit on what happens perhaps when knowledge uh, that is prescribed to us is in the wrong hands so that we don't necessarily get the, ben or to get the benefits of, of what it was intended for. And then we will, we will wrap up with, with really revolution and it, it always starts from the mindset. You can't really act until you, you have the mindset uh, to know. And, and so that's where we're starting from. I'm actually going to start from a, a scientific definition or a mathematics definition, definition of a revolution on the, on the left hand side, which basically says a revolution is a full rotation. A complete turn. Um, if you can have a, a quarter turn or a half turn, but not until it's gone a complete full turn or in terms of degrees, a complete 360 degree turn. That's what maths says a revolution is. And in fact, that there are revolutions in science where an idea can completely change the way in which we view society or nature or, or any, any aspect of, of that uh, based on, on new scientific discoveries. Um, one example, just from the physics world, was uh, Einstein's general theory of relativity. Um, I won't go into the details of what it is, but it's basically Einstein's theory of gravity. And before that, we thought gravity was very much like um, how Newton had described it. And when there was evidence to show that actually Einstein, you know, Einstein's theory of general relativity was actually proven to be effectively true, then in that sense, uh, we had to revisit and rethink what, you know, the very fundamentals of how we thought of space and time and gravity and so on. Uh, so again, revolutions, um, but often in the, in the media, if you like, revolutions, are, are, we, we get this connotation of some sort of forcible overthrow of a government and, and social disorder and, and so on. And that, that is definitely a revolution, but, but be mindful that, that that is not the only type of revolution, and it's not necessarily the only type of revolution that will get results. Um, you can cause revolutions within your own mini ecosystem just in terms of how we think and changing the shape shifting the mindset. But anyway, going back to this re uh, revolution, uh, sticking to the more the science definition of a full rotation. So that, that means uh, every part of, 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 that, of that circle has been rotated a full uh, 360 degrees or a full cycle. And then essentially it would start a new cycle once that has, has occurred. So I'm going to use an analogy of a wheel to think about in a way, broader society. Um, and I'm gonna probably use some scientific terms, um, but let me see if I can uh, bring up the pointer. Moment. All right, so for example, so here's a wheel and we can consider this wheel as society and you've got these uh, spokes, which we could maybe consider as the pillars of society, the things that hold this particular society together. Now we could argue about whether there could be more spokes or, or different uh, labels for them, but effectively these are some of the key pillars. So you've got uh, law and order, of course, education and research, uh, the media, uh, business and technology, and you can probably put finance in there, and also defense. These are all strong pillars that keep society ordered. And, and you can imagine in the center would be the center of power usually a government or, or, or monarchy or some sort of sovereign entity, uh, for example, that would be where the center of power lies. Now, if this was, uh, if this was physics, 
uh, this would basically be what would be known as the center of mass. So even though the, the wheel as a whole has, uh, has mass, uh, if we were to define a point that would represent the center of the mass, it would be uh, in, in the center of the, this wheel here, so for example. And then the thing is now, if the wheel was rotating and rotating clockwise, yeah, so it's rotating, uh, you'd, and you'd think about, well, what would happen uh, to, uh, let's say if you had loose particles on that wheel, what would happen? They would be pushed towards the boundaries. So over time, as this wheel rotates, uh, then particles would move more towards the edges. In other words, further away from the center of power. And if this, I suppose, if this was a well-structured wheel and it was very sort of fluid, then it wouldn't necessarily be a problem because if you could sort of seamlessly move into the different areas of the wheel um, quite seamlessly, that would be fine. But in reality, what happens is that actually, um, as, it, as it rotates, uh, I don't know if you've ever been to a fairground and there was a ride called the centrifuge where you stand on the edge and as it spins, you can feel this force pushing you outwards. So what would happen is you'd be pushed further and further outwards. And if this was a uh, sort of fluid type material in there, more and more of it would be at the edges and, uh, and there would be less, less in the center where, if you like, the center of power is. And this is sometimes what happens in society in the sense that, uh, you know, a large majority uh, feel marginalized and pushed towards the, 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 the edges of society. And then they're sort of kept in, in place by these strong pillars, uh, which are governed very much from the center. And so in our analogy, let's suppose this wheel was, was rotating too fast and we wanted it to slow down so that we can give people a chance to sort of, uh, you know, sort of get more involved in, in some of the some of the the, the, the power uh, within the society. That, then to slow that wheel, what you would require was is a resistive force. Okay, so that means that you would need a force that opposes the motion of the wheel, and usually probably an external force. Um, so that's one way of slowing the wheel down. If we were to take a societal analogy, well, what sort of external force could? And sometimes that happens where you have external pressures that cause, um, cause, cause impacts and, and things to overturn, shall we say. Um, now, I suppose if we wanted to define a, re a revolution as a complete reversal, to sort of reverse the entire uh, wheel, then that would require an even greater force because you would have to first slow it down and then reverse the actual direction, um, which is, quite tricky. But I suppose this is where the analogy at, uh, sort of ends to that extent, because we are not particles on a wheel. I know there may, be, there may be entities who would like us to behave like particles, all nice and ordered on a wheel. But in reality, we are free thinking beings. And as a result, um, we can provide a resistive force against motion. Uh, but this force has to be collective. OK, so in that sense, uh, we can all we can all feel a sense of resistance to certain things. But if we do not do it in a collective manner, in other words, if we are not organized in a collective way, then that that if you like that energy will not will not really have the effect that it would need to in terms of the overall motion. In other words, the wheel would keep turning. So there's a, there's an issue here as well because if this wheel just continued and then you say well what, what, what would happen if you forced more and more mass to the to the edges you would end up with something called a flywheel and this is just an old uh, an example of an old flywheel and i've given a definition here now it's quite technical but we're going to break it down it says a flywheel is a device which uses the con conservation of angular momentum to store rotational energy that's a lot of big words, but let's just break that down. Conservation means to conserve, okay? So you want to keep something. And it says angular means it's turning, and momentum is a force, a moving force. So in other words, you want to conserve that moving force, yeah, the conservation, yeah, to store rotational energy. So the energy it, it, it needs to rotate, it stores it. So in other words, as more mass goes to the edge, that those rotational uh, energy is stored 
at the, at, the, at the edge of the wheel, which makes it basically rotate for longer and requires much harder to stop once you get it going. And it says even here gives you a little bit of, if you like, a, a, a mathematical relationship. It says it's proportional to the product of its momentum, which is like the moving force, uh, or, you know, or moment of inertia, yeah, and the square of the rotational speed. So in other words, the faster it goes, the harder it is to, to, to slow down, which kind of makes sense. So a flywheel, you could imagine in a, in a sort of in an extreme situation, more and more of the mass is being pushed towards the edge of the wheel. So now you've got this flywheel. It still has those spokes, but now the mass is, is, is around the edge, uh, which on the one hand keeps, keeps, gives it a high level of momentum. And on the other hand, it's harder to, to, to slow down. But then the problem is, if you had a situation where the, uh, let's say, the spokes were becoming more compromised, uh, then you would end up with a situation where the, the, the wheels start to buckle. It doesn't rotate uh, correctly. So in other words, the pillars of society, you see signs that the pillars are not quite holding as they should. And that's probably signs of, of when a revolution uh, or at least a type of revolution or even a revolt would start because on the one hand you've got those pillars which are breaking down and on the other hand you've got this resistance which is increasing and I suppose a complete revolution um, would be when you have a complete uh, resistance to the current if you like status quo and by complete resistance you've both got resistance from the masses, but also probably resistance from within as well, within the center of power as well, uh, which would cause this collapse. And so that's one way of, of thinking of a, resolu a revolution of how you would reverse the rotation of the wheel. The other way, of course, is to think, well, let's say you can't reverse it. Maybe a revolution is that the whole wheel needs to collapse. And if it does collapse, as I said, you would see the signs of it by those, those different pillars whether in terms of media, education, business, technology, etc., those those pillars that hold them together uh, start to uh, uh, collapse. So that's one area of uh, sort of setting a context for, for a revolution. But now I want to talk a little bit more about a catalyst and a catalyst for change, because, again, I'm going to use, if you like, a personal experience from some of my own research. And I'm going to show how I tr use those same principles to create a, a catalyst for change. I suppose the first thing we need to do is define what a catalyst is. Again, I'm going to give you the scientific definition of a, of a catalyst, uh, often used in chemical reactions. And it says a catalyst is a substance that enables a chemical reaction to proceed at, at usually a faster rate or under different conditions than otherwise possible. So in other words, you have this reaction, which would have proceeded anyway, but when you add this catalyst, somehow this reaction happens much quicker. And they said it can either change, it can either happen by uh, you know, adding a substance, or you might change the conditions under which the reaction occurs so that it can then proceed quicker. So I suppose a question that, had, um, that I obviously considered a long time ago was how can we increase the take up of physics within the black community? Now, putting that into context, when I was doing my PhD many moons ago, um, I didn't know any black physicists at all. Um, my, as I've said before, my family are from Jamaica, from, from the Caribbean. Um, so growing up in the UK and going, do, doing a PhD in physics, I didn't know any other physicists. Now, I just assumed that they were around, I just maybe didn't see them. But over time, you get to realize they were very few and far between. So the question is why, uh, especially given the importance of physics. And in, in previous talks, I've talked about how important physics is as a subject because it underpins so many other scientific and engineering disciplines. So why are we not getting involved in this thing that, that generates so much technology that affects all of our lives in so many different ways, why are we not involved? And so um, that was the first question. And then the second part was how can, what can, what can I maybe do or what can we do as a community 
to increase the take-up of physics given its importance. So I took some lessons from my time studying atmospheric physics um, and in particular there was an area uh, around um, ozone, ozone depletion and uh, the ozone layer is in a certain part of the atmosphere called the stratosphere and there was a time probably about 20 years ago or more where there was a real big concerns about the, the hole in the ozone layer and the reason for that primarily is that if, if there is a hole in the ozone layer then more UV light ultraviolet light will get through the atmosphere and particularly those um, who are more susceptible um, will, will, could potentially increase in, in skin cancer. Um, now, often melanin it, it does absorb a lot of those frequencies, but we can go on to that, talk about that later. But the point is, I was looking into uh, doing some research into ozone depletion and we were trying to understand what was the mechanism that drives this depletion, what makes it happen so quickly. And then it turns out that uh, there, in the stratosphere there are these small ice particles called polar stratospheric clouds. Now these are solid particles and what would happen is when these particles existed ozone would basically absorb or stick to the surface of it and then the CFCs, these are chlorofluorocarbons, they would also stick to the surface of these clouds and then that's how the reaction would occur and that's how ozone would deplete. So in other words the presence of the, these ice particles these polar stratospheric clouds would actually speed up the reaction. And it's a similar situation with cloud formation generally, that you need to form these cloud droplets, you need these seed particles known as cloud condensation nuclei. So you need these seed particles to be present and then water can kind of um, absorb onto it and then create the, the, the droplets. So in other words, the presence of these seed sort of trace particles are very important in catalyzing the reaction. So when I try to now think, well, okay, that's quite interesting. How can I uh, sort of draw an analogy with my question about attracting more black physicists? So one of the things um, that, that, I, that I then thought, well, okay, part of this reaction is that you need to be, you need to have a stable platform, a, a safe space, a stable environment so that you can attract uh, these, you know, if you like, these, these gas-like particles uh, to the surface. So uh, when I look back now in hindsight, I was, you know, as at the same institution for many years, had an office, um, and many of the young undergraduates, black undergraduates, would come in my office, and that was their safe space to have a chat about all kinds of things. But these sorts of things then allowed them to connect with others, who, and, especially, and others who had graduated, and then we'd invite them back and so on. So in a sense, I was acting like a polar stratospheric cloud. I was just the stable constant. And then whilst if I wasn't there, many of them would have still graduated, probably still done very well and still gone on to, to do great things, but they probably wouldn't have known each other. And then from a community perspective, we've, lost the, we've missed a lost opportunity because now we've, we've got a, a cohort of, of black physicists with talent whom we could, if they act collectively, we can do some, some really impactful things. And so that's what basically happened. I, I basically tried to, to, to speed up the reaction by being present and allowing others to connect. And uh, I mentioned the Black It Lab family probably about a year ago, last time I, I gave a talk, and I want to still give you an update because um, things are definitely moving at pace. Um, we've, we've already... Um, ran our first inaugural research summer school for and engineers across an early uh, sorry a, a, a sort of a photo uh, with some of the cohort um, and we've also linked up with other groups like black in academia and so on we've also been involved we made a submission to a parliamentary inquiry into diversity in stem for example um, and we made a, a, a joint submission and a collective voice is far more powerful than any one individual voice. We've got collaborations with, amongst others, Oxford University, for example, Institute of Physics, 
and others. The Ogden Trust is a big funder of, of physics programs, for example. Um, as I said, we've had our inaugural research summer school. We're also putting on summer schools for young people as well, in, con in conjunction with, with Oxford. Uh, and we've also just received funding to connect African-American physicists with the UK, with the UK physicists. Um, and this is um, under the umbrella of, of sort of creating a global black physicist, uh, black physics movement, if you like. And part of this funding will allow African-American physicists to come over here, uh, over to the UK and give a series of, of talks, uh, prominent ones as well. And we will also send a delegate of UK based physicists to the US uh, so that we can essentially cross pollinate, so to speak. And again, uh, when you connect the dots, I don't know about you, but when I was young, I used to like dot to dot, probably because I'm not very artistic. Uh, but there is something about connecting the dots, following the numbers, connecting the dots, and then you know, the picture is revealed. And it's a bit like that. I like the idea that we can now connect with the US, uh, those in Europe and uh, uh, Africa and the Caribbean, and then eventually we'll have a, a global movement of black physicists. Now, of course, this is just in my one particular area. And I'm not saying that everybody should be doing physics, far from it. But I would say if you do know anybody who's interested in physics, there is a huge amount of support now. And I've also given some links uh, at the bottom, social media links for the Black It Lab uh, family. So, but the key thing is, is to recognize the importance of what it does, what it can do. Um, and so that way, as a community, we become more literate in this space, because it's, it's only going to um, in, in increase. Uh, as, as Brother Andrew mentioned, it's also recognized more sort of traditionally. So uh, receive a, a Royal Society Award uh, for commitment to, to equity, increasing equity in, in physics and in STEM. Um, and, and a large part of that was, you know, for forming a group like the Black Lab family, the first UK network of black physicists. So often, uh, even though you don't do these things for awards, you do it for a cause. Um, if, if your cause is, is just, you should stick to it um, because in the end, uh, you will even be recognized in places you weren't really looking to be recognized, but you, it, nevertheless, um, it certainly, um, certainly is, it, you know, helps and shows and justifies um, some of what you do. Okay, I'm going to talk a little bit about melanin. And the reason why I'm saying that is because I've, I've given examples of when um, you can use a, 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 a scientific approach to tackle social inequalities and all sorts of things outside of the traditional discipline. And so I want to sort of give an, sort of give an idea of when potentially if uh, knowledge, scientific knowledge, in this case in health, is held in, in, in not say the wrong hands, but held in hands which are not necessarily uh, have your best interests at heart, then it could potentially cause lots of, 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 of things, uh, issues and things for concern. Uh, so, I mean, I think we can talk melanin. I mean, uh, last time I was in New York, there was plenty of T-shirts. Uh, it seems to be quite popular uh, to talk about it nowadays. So let's talk about melanin. And of course, I'll start with the science because it, it is a chemical. It does have a chemical structure. Um, and you, the, the way how they, they determine it, as I put at the bottom, uh, they, they use high intensity neutrons, X-rays and muons. So they fire these at melanin samples to understand uh, its structure. So in other words, melanin is a very uh, resilient um, substance. Uh, if you're firing high intensity neutrons or X-rays or muons at it, just to understand and characterize what, what, what structure it is, then you know it's quite a, you know, it is a very uh, robust and resilient uh, substance. Uh, and as you can see, it has a chemical structure um, given here, okay? And it also has some optical properties. In other words, how it interacts with light. Um, and so in terms of its, uh, how it absorbs, you know, its absorption properties, then you can see, uh, in, if we look at the, the graph on the right-hand side, uh, then it has a, quite a high absorption at very short wavelengths, okay? So what that means is short wavelengths mean high energy, okay? So it absorbs high energy, high frequencies, okay? Short wavelengths mean high frequencies. If you remember the waves talk, maybe some of this will be familiar. Uh, but not only that, it absorbs right across uh, the, the, the sort of spectrum really across right across the spectrum 
from very high frequencies right sort of down into the, the sort of low frequencies. So in other words, melanin absorbs across a, a long, a large, uh, it's got a large bandwidth, as they say. Uh, some other sort of molecular properties, it's an antioxidant, okay? It's a free radical, that means it can react with, with many things. Um, it's, it's also got, as I said, a broad band, it absorbs in the UV and the visible, okay? And also it's a non-radiative non relaxation of photo-excited electronic states. What a mouthful! But what does that really mean? What it means is it can absorb light in the form of photons and it can basically absorb that energy and redistribute that energy within the molecule as opposed to absorbing the light and getting excited and kicking the light back out again. It absorbs that energy and redistributes it. So the molecule can reshape itself based on how much energy it absorbs. And these are just the, the molecular and optical properties of, of melanin. There are also the magnetic properties, properties to do with melanin as an iron. There are physiochemical properties, even semiconductor properties of melanin. So as a chemical, it's very interesting. Quite surprising that it's not really studied in, in huge depth in, in general um, biochemistry or medicine, but nevertheless, as a chemical, it is a very interesting uh, molecule. How and where is melanin produced in the body? Well, there are two melanocytes uh, in the brain. Uh, the, the, pineal, uh, the pineal gland uh, is, is one of the key uh, melanin producing sites uh, in the brain. Okay, and the funny thing is, I was trying to look for lobes of the brain, well, just looking at, at sort of the brain generally, and it's rare that they mention the pineal gland and what its actual function is. You can see in this diagram um, from Queensland Brain Institute, so they, they seem quite credible, they seem to have a good understanding of all the different parts of the brain and what they do, but for some reason the pineal gland, which if we go back is right sort of near in the, in the sort of uh, center here um, is just somehow missing for some reason. Uh, it'd be interesting to know what those properties are. But nevertheless, we know that it is a it is a site, a production site for for melanin. And so um, we're now so we're now going to think about. In fact, just before I go on to that, I do want to mention something about the pineal gland. Many years ago, uh, I was I. I Let's just say I came across some information which said that uh, for, for a melanated body, the pineal gland does not become calcified. Uh, but for, you know, for, for most, you know, in, in sort of most Western medicine, it says after a certain age, the, the, the pineal gland becomes calcified. And what that means is there's some bony substance that sort of grows over it, it becomes hardened. Uh, but actually it remains active for a sort of highly melanated body. Now, I actually asked a medical I'll say a medical expert who was also a friend uh, about this particular point and all they could confirm is that in all the medical books it just assumes that everybody's pineal gland becomes calcified but in reality uh, for a melanated body the pineal gland doesn't become calcified so this is one example where that assumption is just implied in the literature and lots of things can be sort of developed as a result but in fact, they may not have taken, uh, taken the fact that we have melanin into account in that particular assumption. So another example is in, in x-rays, for example. I won't go into too much uh, detail because I'm, I'm mindful, mindful of the time and so on. But in terms of x-rays and how x-ray scans work, um, basically uh, you, you shine some light and it could be well, different, different frequencies of light, depending, but X-ray, usually, X-ray light through an object. And then the object will absorb some of that light, and then some of that light will be transmitted. And you can use that information, especially to pick up things like tumours and so on, if you see a dark patch and so on. So it's a really, really powerful technique. Uh, but of course, X-rays, as we know, are quite high energy, and the, you know, the wrong dosage or too much higher dosage can cause damage like anything else. Uh, but then again, the dosage is decided based upon a body which basically will transmit most of it and let most of it through. But as, as I've showed you earlier, melanin absorbs 
quite, uh, quite, quite highly, especially at high energy. Now, is this taken into account? That's the question. As I said, I'm not a medical expert, but these are the sorts of questions uh, that, that sort of spring to mind. Uh, one moment. I need to take this pointer off. Uh, right. OK, well, these are the, the sort of questions that, that spring to mind. Um, what is the ex an appropriate exposure level for, for an X-ray or an MRI scan, for example? I mean, and when I say that, for, for a melanated body, do we really know what it is or are we working based on what, what has been uh, de derived conventionally uh, through Western um, studies? How are the chances of producing what we call a false positive uh, diagnosis affected? Or, or, or even a false negative. In other words, how, what are the chances of being misdiagnosed? What are the chances of seeing a dark patch and assuming it's something when it's not? And vice versa, what are the chances of missing something uh, when in fact there is something there? Um, again, these are questions, and I, I've called them thought-provoking questions because often we can probably even think in our, you know, in our lived experience of personal examples of misdiagnosis of all sorts of things. But I've just given you an example here of where it's important for we to have more of an understanding of ourselves uh, so that we know that when things are, uh, are sort of prescribed, we're aware of what the effects are on, on ourselves. And also how much of Western medicine was developed with a med melanated body in mind? As I said, I've just touched on a couple of things in terms of x-rays, for example, but there are so much, there's so much uh, Western medicine that's been sort of um, developed and very little has, has really taken into account the fact that we have this, you know, large abundance of this chemical melanin. And so it leads us to say, are we really just scratching the surface with respect to melanin and its role in the body? Some of these questions, I'm sure um, many of our learned audience will, will know, but the point is, these are the sorts of things as a community, we need to start, start investigating more. And going back to, let's say, uh, the Blackett Lab family and other groups like that. If we have our own scientists and engineers, we can look into the things that we that are of concern to us straight away without necessarily relying on other bodies and institutions to you know deem it worthy before they step into that territory. So I think I'm going to sort of draw this to a close. I'm quite happy to, to take one or two questions, but it's really just to give you a, a sort of an, a, an opener of how science can be applied to lots of areas outside of science, especially in the sort of social justice area and inequalities and so on. Uh, and I hope it's given you a flavor. It's definitely not the end destination. It's more of a signpost. Uh, and I think I'll leave it there. Thank you very much. Wow, fire, 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 brother. Come on, King. Come on, big brother. Fire's in the house. And, bro, you still got time. I don't know what the speakers are doing to that. You have still <laughs> got time, brother. Oh, wow. Brother, amazing, 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 my King. And, um, Boy, I'm quite you, happy to take some questions. Oh, I, 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 Samara, Jurita, are there any questions in the Bobbins? Uh, uh, are there any questions that you'd like to ask? You can type or let us know, raise your hand if necessary. But if there's any questions, wow, Bobba, you killed, you killed the game. You killed the game, my king. Jeez. Jeez. I'm going to lower all the hands that have been there. If there are anyone that would like to ask questions, you can raise your hand or type it down. Um, in the meantime, um, Dr. Mark, uh, please, brother, I mean, that, that was serious. In the meantime, brother, could you just, again, using the teachings of the Honorable Marcus Messiah Garvey, how did he inspire you? How did you get into, I've heard you talk about it before, but I would like you to share it again. How, how do you get into your field of physics and you're coming from the streets. Please explain, brother. And why is it important right. that we have this type of knowledge and be a revolutionary at the same time? Well, I suppose, um, so, yeah, I mean, I, growing up at, at, at school, I think many of us at a young age, we have an inquisitive mind, whatever 
background, kind of you are, you know, we have an inquisitive mind, we want to know how yeah. things work, we like those. So that's not that that's not different. I think what happens probably at secondary school, by the end of it, a lot of that inquisitive nature gets sort of almost beaten out of you. Um, but I think for, for, for me, I was always, um, you know, I was not really one to be told or, de you know, defined by how others define me. I was always told, you know, told that, you, you know, you, you, you're defined by how you see yourself. Yes. So if I saw myself as something, it's going to be hard for someone to tell me, uh, no, you're not, you're not that, you know, you're, you're not going to be that thing. Not to say that you definitely will, but I, I'm not going to be discouraged by someone telling me I won't be. Yes. Um, and so I think it's just that resilience. It's that, it's that Jamaican resilience, I suppose. But uh, in terms of the Marcus Garvey um, aspect, I've always sort of known about Marcus Garvey as a, as a sort of a, a leader and a you know, freedom fighter and all those sorts of things. Um, but I suppose when I, when I got more into the, the, the sort of science, I realized that Marcus Garvey said some interesting things about science. And so that's what sort of gravitated me to, well, what did he say about science? And also the fact that then, you know, two of his, his sons, one was a physics teacher, another was a, a, a surgeon, for example. So he clearly had a, had, you know, he, some, some say he, you know, he, he, was, he was able to, to sort of foresee lots of things, um, but he clearly foresaw something in science and technology. And so it's just one area that, that I pick up and try to try to sort of, keep that message going because I don't think that message is any any less relevant today than it was a hundred years ago. In fact, it's probably more relevant. Um, so that's, that's, where, that, that's, that's where it comes from, really. Uh, yeah, I mean, that's all I can really put it down to. And then, of course, music. Music keeps it real, you see, because if you're, if you're a DJ and all that kind of Come thing, it keeps it real. <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, um, so, so, yeah, so I like, I like a lot of all kind of music, reggae, dance, or all kind of things. And I found particularly with reggae music, it's, it's more than just music, it, you know, it, it, it's a message as well. Usually there's a message in the music as well as the music. And, you know, growing up, when, you, when you're looking to, to, to try and connect the dots as to who you are and where you came from and what your roots are, then I think in, in my sense, um, then reggae music was a, was a thing that was kind of reminding you and giving you, giving you hints of, of where you're coming from and then it's for you to kind of look into that further and so music yeah so music is a thing what keeps it real you can't to me i don't see how you can on the one hand really have a strong love of roots reggae and reality and culture and all those things and then exist let's say in the ivory towers and and, and somehow be a completely different person because that kind of um teaching keeps you real that kind of you know keeps it real and I've always felt that if I was to lose, like, like Marcus Garvey says, a man without knowledge of himself is like a tree without roots. So if I was to lose who I was, I don't think I could even uh, properly stand firm in those kind of uh, environments. So, so brother, a question has been asked, how did the sound system fire your knowledge in physics? Now that's specific now. What, 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 right. what, what, what correlates a DJ with physics then? Okay, well, um, I would say that it's, it's not so much that the sound system made me choose physics, but I realized there was a lot of technology in sound systems. So, so for example, um, in terms of a lot of the innovation that happened in sound system, you realize that there is scientific uh, physics and, and science behind it. So, um, so designing, the, let's say, the speaker design and wanting to design it in a way that throws the bass towards the back of the room. There's a certain type of design, and a lot of that is, 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 is physics. It's acoustics and, and maths and physics. At the time, um, being involved in sound system culture, we, you know, I was aware these things were going on. You had people designing amplifiers, de designing all sorts of circuitry and so on. Um, but as I started to get older, I realized that some of the, 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 if you like, the technology, the physics I was learning, actually was not that different from what these guys were practicing so that's but at the same time it was almost like you know the physics that you learn at school and college is in a high esteem but then the actual physics that you're practicing as a practitioner was not really recognized in the same arena so again I've always been wanting to try and bring light to that to say well actually within our community we have physicists we have innovators we have 
electrical engineers. We have all those sorts of things, but they just might not be recognized in exactly the same way as you know, someone who's a, a doctor, a professor, or whatever in, a, in an institution. But that doesn't mean it's not as valuable. And in fact, what really got me was that there was you know, certain designs from sound system designs that made its way into mainstream PA systems and so on, which means that companies were making money off these designs. What? Say that again. There were, there were certain designs in terms of um, PA designs, speaker, speaker designs, uh, amplifier designs and so on, which, uh, because often back in the day, you would give those designs to companies to build for you on your behalf often. And so we wouldn't necessarily, we wouldn't patent any of that. And so as a result, um, you know, some of those designs made their way into mainstream PA systems and so on. Uh, and those companies, they would have patented it because they want to protect their business. And so the money, the wealth that was generated from that idea is not really going to the community. And those are the kind of things that irk me, because on the one hand, we're talking about economic empowerment, but on the other hand, we're not even protected and making sure we own what we create. So we, we need to square that, that circle. Wow, brother, wow. And, 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 and also, brother, in terms of DJs who are mixing music, is there science in that as well? Absolutely. Um, I mean, it, so in, uh, for example, in hip hop, so Grandmaster Flash, he, he, he invented the crossfader. Uh, so in, in a mixer, most mixers have a left and a right channel. And then you have a crossfader that allows you to fade from one side to the other. Well, it was, it was Grandmaster Flash, the, the hip hop DJ, who was also he did electronics at college, who actually made that circuitry. Now, every mixer has a crossfader. Similar wow. thing he invented, similar thing he invented was a slip mat. Now the slip mat that goes between the turntable and the record that allows you to scratch and mix. And so yeah. it's got to be frictionless and that sort of thing. His mother was a seamstress. So he found the right type of material and ironed on starch to it to, on it to make it the right material. Again, it wasn't patented, but every DJ needs to work with slip mats. So these are the sorts of things that we kind of do because that's what we do, but we need to start thinking, well, others don't just see it as something we do. That is something that can be monetized, marketed and profited from. Wow. <laughs> Brother, this is, this is serious. This is serious. Um, if, if we, if we, I mean, brother, I mean, even sister Judith just said, wow, wow, wow. So we're not paid. In other words, we are literally being scientists and inventors, and we don't even know it. And yeah. we're not paid for it. That's right. And, uh, and, and that's nothing new, because we know we talk about scientists and inventors in the past, like Imhotep and, and, and you know, from way back in the antiquities. Why would that change now for any particular reason? We have that innovative spirit. Uh, they, they say, uh, uh, what is it now? Uh, invention is the mother of necess or necessity or something like that. But the point is, as a people, we've been in situations where we've had to innovate. We've had mm. to innovate in many different ways. And as a result, um, but it's, 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 those, it's those inventions which we would probably, and by, probably by design, we don't realize the potential of what we what we what we invent we think well it's just something to solve a problem for us but in fact you're, you're potentially solving the problems for many many others and that's where um you know just like we need more scientists and engineers we need more sort of patent lawyers who are working for for we shall we say wow i'm um, brother just just very quickly then just just one other question what as a physicist and as a scientist i know that many parents should they worry, because many of them do come to me, should they worry about the type of music and the frequency of the music that our young people are, lead, um, are playing? Because they're saying that they believe that the frequency, the vibrational rate, and whatever you okay, um, affects the minds of the youth. Now, as a scientist and as a physicist, is there any truth behind that, brother? Well, I mean, okay, so in, in abstract terms, Music is, of course, a vibration and it is a frequency and, it, and the sound causes pressure waves in the air and they will interact with you. So in other words, you vibrate and, and resonate at a particular frequency and, and the music you listen to will then reson will, will resonate with you. And that can amplify yes. the effect. 
So I suppose in scientific terms, yes, but I suppose it depends, it depends how grounded you are to some extent. So you can't completely, uh, I think as parents, we can't completely absolve ourselves of, of, of responsibility to say, well, because my, my child listens to this music, it's inevitably that's the reason why they are the way they are. Because I think if, they, if, 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 if young people have a good grounding, a good sense of grounding, then we know in society you are going to be exposed to all sorts of things, whether it's within your parents' control or without. So what you want to do is equip them to be able to stay grounded and be able to process whatever information comes to them in whatever form in a way uh, that, that, they, that, that is conducive to their upliftment and progress. And that's, to me, more of a, an issue than trying to somehow stifle what you hear, because I just don't know if that's possible to stifle what you see, read and hear. But I think it is more, it is definitely uh, possible to, to, to analyze more, critically analyze more of what you see and hear um, in a way and, and ask yourself, is this conducive to my upliftment? If it's no, it's probably not worth entertain, spending too much time on. If it is, it, then maybe that's the direction you should be heading. Brilliant, brilliant, brilliant. Um, brother, um, we have um, an international guest that we just love on this platform. He always tunes in and he's highly regarded. He's um, a brother that's um, respected worldwide, um, the ex-ambassador to Namibia from Jamaica, Professor mm -hmm. Earl Taylor. Professor Earl, are you with us? Professor Earl Taylor, are you with us? I don't know if your microphone's still muted, but I understand that you wanted to ask a question or make a comment. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Uh, thank you very much, um, my brother. Um, and it's good to see and to hear your, your presentation. I, I wanted to look at two issues. One, melanin. And... Uh, for many years, in fact, I have developed the theory that um, we, we absorb a lot more light than we reflect. Um, and I wanted to put that into, into context to, to see our capacity as black people to, to understand to be resilient and to be relaxed. Um, you, you know, the question is, um, we, are, we are tolerant um, of others. We are, we are receptive, we are accommodative of others. Um, and it is a strength that we have sometimes we do not know it. Um, so we can absorb pain, we can, we can absorb um, curses, we can absorb treatments. Mm -hmm. um, using the gun because it's, it's a reflection of how much we absorb. Now, um, we have cultures that, that have intervened and has changed that, that perspective so that we become violent now, um, whereas we weren't. So we have absorbed a new culture. Um, instead of being accommodative and absorbent, we are now going to reflect um, that. So that's one concept I want you to discuss. The second one is that um, I would like to know what fears you have as of, as a physicist, because there's a there's a complex relationship between chemistry and, and physics, um, mm -hmm. and it comes out as you go higher on the EMS, um, where um, low and high energy um, have their roles, and when we start to expand higher frequency. We are now going into an area that is very uncertain, very unclear what is the downside. So I'd like to hear your characterization of 
chemistry and physics, especially in relationship to health, 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 health care, health science. Okay. Um, well, th thanks again. Thank you for, for, for your question and and, um, and for, for sharing some of your thoughts. Um, well, it's interesting you talked about that we, 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 we reflect what we absorb effectively. So what we, what we take in, we, we reflect that. Uh, in physics, there is actually um, something that, that, that reflects perfectly. The, so in other words, the, 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 the energy it, it absorbs and it reflects exactly the energy it emits, I should say, emits uh, the energy that it absorbs perfectly is known as a perfect black body radiator or radi black body radiation. So, uh, so in that sense, uh, if you were to take that analogy as a, as a, as a, as a black body, um, and that is a physics term as a, as a black body uh, ra radiation, then uh, I, I can certainly see that if we, if, you know, like you said, we seem to be able as a people to absorb everything, both the good and the bad. Just like I said, melanin absorbs all frequencies from the high energy right through to the, to the long range, sort of low frequencies. Um, maybe we as a, you know, to some extent, we as a people seem to absorb everything so we can both produce, you know, almost the very, you know, the, the best that, that mankind can, can produce. And sometimes we, we display some of the worst. And so the question is, uh, is that a reflect, are, are we just being a reflection of what, what is, what is being input to us, you know, what we're being exposed to? Um, and there, there could well be some, I think there could be some, some, some um, truth in that, in the sense that, you know, we are, we are shaped both by who we are fundamentally, but also our environment. Um, but I think, ultimately, if we spend more time knowing who we are fundamentally, then there's going to be less chance or less likelihood of the environment shaping you as much. Uh, that hope, hopefully that answers your first question. And the second part, did you say it was the fears as a physicist and, and the, the connection between chemistry and physics? So he's gone now, brother. Okay. Uh, so in terms of chemistry and physics, uh, I've always, I, I was an undergraduate chemist and then I, I did a PhD in physics. So um, I've always seen chemistry to me as basically chemistry is, is about matter. It's about matter and and different forms of matter, whether solid, liquid, gas, and how how they they combine in different ways to create new types of matter. Um, physics is about energy and how it interacts with matter. So you kind of, you know, so they are connected in that sense. So so physics tries to understand the forces and the energy uh, that that are involved when matter interacts. Uh, so to me, physics and, and chemistry, they are very much related. Um, I'd probably say physics is slightly more fundamental because it goes beyond where chemistry ends. So, for example, there are parts of physics that you don't really, you wouldn't study in chemistry, like uh, cosmology and the study of the universe and that sort of thing at one end. And also at the other end in like very small sort of particle physics, um, you know, elementary particles and things. So in that sense, I think chemistry is part of, a, uh, of, of, the, of the broader scientific, sort of scientific spectrum. But yeah, that, I mean, I, I'm, I'm, a, I'm, I'm a big advocate of chemistry because as humans, most of what we interact with in the physical world is chemistry. So we can't ignore chemistry. Um, but I think physics uh, often looks at uh, how, you know, the, the energy and forces that are behind these interactions. Fantastic, fantastic. Brother Dr. Mark, we bow to you. We, we, we thank you, brother. It's been an amazing night with yourself. Brother Ron Spears, are you still with us? Brother Ron Spears, are you still with us? Yes, oh, sir. We went to see two phenomenal physicists, um, engineers, whatever, on the same platform, one from the US, one from the UK. Um, you've heard our brother Dr. Mark stating that, you know, uh, is bringing up a whole movement of physicists from the UK and going to be connecting with our brothers and sisters in America, man. You know, it, 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 what would you like to say to our brother before we end tonight? No, I definitely enjoyed the presentation. Pleasure to meet you, uh, Dr. Mark. And um, 
No, the uh, you know, when you were talking about black body radiation, that was my first lecture in quantum uh, physics class. First lesson was on black body radiation and melanin's effect uh, on the body, which I just spoke about a little bit earlier. So, uh, and my my daughter is actually uh, uh, chemical engineering, a senior at Hampton uh, in chemical engineering. So I try to debate her every now and then about physics versus chemistry. But anyway, debating a debating a twenty year old is you know not much of a debate. But anyway, uh, no, I I, I definitely uh, enjoyed hearing about your grant to help. Uh, bridge, uh, you know, physicists in America or outside of Europe with physicists in Europe. You know, the beauty of going to a, an HBC or historically black college uh, here, me going to Morehouse, I was surrounded by black physicists, both as the professors, one from the Caribbean, one from, I think, Nigeria and the other from America, and then nothing but black physicists in the room, in the classroom. So you're just surrounded by black excellence and it just doesn't help but empower you. So it was a beautiful thing. And then I talked to a, a lot of alumni who are, you know, black physicists. So I know, you know, many of us, you know, who studied it in college, don't necessarily profess, you know, work in that field mm -hmm. professionally, but, you know, just listening to your presentation, I understand, I almost could do the presentation for you because I knew where you were going with the wheel and the spokes and, and how all one plays on all the others. It's just amazing how the mind works and how we process things. So it's a, it's a beautiful thing to, you know, see those similarities. So I, I'm definitely um, congratulate you on, uh, on your achievements and, and more importantly, the impact that you're uh, having on the next generation of, you know, scientists and definitely echo your, um, your, your sentiment to, you know, for others to teach their youth in these STEM fields, because it's such a beautiful thing, the, the way the mind works and the better understand that and put it into connection with the cosmology. And the last thing I'll mention, because I, I knew that you were a DJ. I'm in, we're into that house music here in uh, in the States. Okay, but uh, but it, is, yeah. it is Chicago frequency house. and vibration, but it didn't surprise me that you are uh, drawing on the right side of your brain now. Physics and chemistry and science is very left brain. But when you when you draw upon the creative side with the right brain, once you become conscious, that's when that's when the creativity and the revolution really, really happens. So, so those are just my quick thoughts on, uh, you know, your presentation. Glad I was to, able to be a participant. No, well, well, absolutely. Thank you. No, absolutely. Thank you. And also, um, what I was saying about staying ground, staying grounded in such a way that no, almost no matter what you're exposed to, you, 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 you know, you reduce the chance of it influencing you so much. Um, the work that you're doing with the rites of passage of, of, of young, young, young men, young boys, and so on. That is exactly what we're talking about. I, I, I'm almost, I can almost guarantee that, that uh, the question which was asked about the, the frequency of the music that affects the child, I suspect that if, if those young men had listened to that same music, it probably wouldn't affect them in the same way. So the question is, is, is it, is, I mean, it is the music to some extent, but in reality, it's, it's how you prepare yourself to deal with when you're exposed to those frequencies. So yeah, it's, so it's, it's complementary work all around. And that's, that's what I mean that we, we, we all have to, you know, many hands make light work. And we, if we collectively work and, and connect those black dots, black quantum dots, uh, then, <laughs> then we, will, we will reveal the big picture in the end. <laughs> Absolutely. Yes. Absolutely. Yeah, I, I put in the chat, uh, Jedi, Jedi mind tricks only work on weak minds. Uh, the, the signal is strong with what they're trying to do. Yes. But uh, there's a lot of weak, unfortunately, there's a lot of weak minds out there. And then uh, what I said on your on the uh, the webinar last week that Rev Shock stole was what you do frequently becomes your frequency. What you listen to frequently becomes your frequency. And so if you're constantly listening to, you know, F that B, F that B, you know, I'm going to make this money. I'm going to, you know, if you listen to that and it just over and over again, it becomes your frequency. Whereas if you look at me, you listen to Diane Reeves and John Coltrane and Anita Baker and things, it just increases your vibration so that when a song comes, when, you, when you're in a song with your teenager and he takes over your radio and plays some nonsense, it does not affect you. You know, Robert, can you because you have the you have the strong vibration 
on your side, the foundation, as Dr. Mark was saying, but the reality is we got a lot of folks out here without that foundation. And so, yes, the music is having an effect. The, the frequency, the, the purposeful frequency in the music is having its effect on many of our people without that foundation. So, yes, it's up to us to build that foundation in our children and in those who, who, who are not getting it at home. So yes, we have that responsibility. You say, can you say that quote one more time, Bob? Because <laughs> you, you, you set fire on the chat line just now. Say that quote one more time, King. What you do frequently becomes your frequency. Woo! You heard it on the Hidden Truth platform, brothers and sisters. And yes, brother Andrew Mohammed is going to teeth that line as well. That is a blam, blam. I stole it, Rev Shock stole it. Now you could steal it, Andrew. <laughs> brothers and sisters, this is the Hidden Truth. You've had two award-winning scientists with us tonight, brother Ron Spares from the US Survey and Dr. Mark Richards from the UK. We're just out in sunny Portugal and wanted to say... Go on, Papa G. Easy, Rastafari. Yeah. So, Dr. Mark of the Imperial College, world renowned, one of the top um, scientific colleges, universities here in the UK, was here with us tonight. Keynote speaker, absolutely talking about the revolution, the science of revolution. And come on, brothers and sisters, our beautiful brother, brother Ron Spears in the U, um, US of A. Black matter lives. Come on, man. That alone, that alone, brothers and sisters, is a subject within itself. Because that's science now. That's history. That's chemistry. Black matter lives. Oh, my. I'm just excited. Just, just saying those words, man. That is phenomenal, phenomenal, phenomenal. So, brothers and sisters, you know, this is a conscious grassroots community um, event that we have. And it's an honor and a blessing to have two of the best um, sharing their wisdom with us tonight. Come on, brothers and sisters. And I want to give out a shout out to Sister Soul Melanin, who tuned in all the way from Tanzania. Our sister gave us a phenomenal update, showed us that we're living in the matrix in Europe. We are living in the matrix. Africa is calling all of us. Africa is now calling all of us, brothers and sisters. And it was a blessing to see our beautiful queen, Sister Abby, man. Pure love to her. Brothers and sisters, the Hidden Truth team is dedicated to you every single week. And, you know, the truth may offend.